So hi, my name is Rafael Paz, and I'm going to talk about consensus through herding. And this is a joint work with uh, Hubert Chen and Elaine Shi that was presented in Eurocrypt uh, this year. So just to recall what we're talking about, uh, consensus, in the problem of consensus, we have a, a set of nodes here that would like to uh, replicate uh, a ledger of transactions. And uh, uh, what I mean, when I say consensus, this really is what you guys probably refer to as, uh, today as a permission blockchain, but it's a concept been studied for, for a long time uh, from the uh, early 80s and in fact even earlier. So we have these nodes, uh, uh, they uh, all would like to keep track of a, a set of transactions and require two properties. The first one is consistency, which roughly speaking says that all these nodes should actually agree on what the ledger of transactions is. And the second one is liveness, that roughly speaking says that uh, whenever someone would like to add some transactions, they should be, it should be possible to add them to this uh, list. So a little bit more precisely, uh, the consistency property actually consists of two things, and it's quite important that you have both of these two properties. So the first one is that at any point in this interaction, if we look at uh, uh, two nodes here, we require that, let's say me and you, we require that either my ledger is a prefix of yours or vice versa. Potentially, I received a transaction that you haven't seen uh, yet, but you will receive it very shortly. But in the very case, we should agree on the prefixes. And the second property is that I should actually agree with myself in the future. So whatever I have in my ledger now should remain there. Okay, this is often uh, sometimes called future self-consistency. So that's a consistency property. We really see more or less the same thing. And the second property, liveness, uh, says that whenever some honest guy sees some transaction that should be added to this ledger, uh, we'll have the property that, in fact, everybody's ledger will contain it within some bounded time t. And this bounded time t could be a function of the number of players and maybe some security parameter uh, and maybe also some uh, network delay parameter. Okay? But the key property we want is that whenever someone wants to add something, it should get added within, say, one minute, and everybody should have it in their ledger. Okay? Uh, now, this notion of liveness is actually a very strong notion of liveness and can only be achieved in something called a synchronous communication network. So that's the communication model we're going to be talking about. So in this synchronous model, we consider protocols that proceed in rounds, and I really think of these rounds as time steps. Maybe each time step is one second, one millisecond, some kind of uh, notion of time. And we're dealing with a, something called diffusion model. This is uh, uh, the type of uh, uh, model that we typically analyze Bitcoin in. So uh, we assume that when somebody wants to send a message, they can send it to everybody on the network. So this message is sent out and it, it diffuses through the network and it will arrive at everybody's computer within some fixed delta number of rounds, number of time steps. So in Bitcoin, typically we assume that whenever I want to send a message, it will arrive at everybody within, uh, let's say, 10 seconds. Right? That's a very pessimistic upper bound on the time it takes for a message to arrive at, uh, at everybody. And finally, we assume that message authenticated whenever somebody wants to send a message, uh, everybody uh, knows who it came from. Okay, we'll discuss that assumption a little bit later, but one thing I would like to point out here is that this assumption on diffusion that a message arrives at everybody within delta time steps can often be relaxed, and you say it only holds for good players. So whenever an honest player wants to send something, it arrives at everybody at, uh, within delta time steps, bad players uh, maybe not. But in fact, without loss of generality, turns out that it suffices to, uh, to, we can actually make the assumption that it holds even for good and bad players. So because of one can make, just make sure that good players always echo everything they hear from everybody and therefore. So from now on, I'm going to assume that whenever somebody sends a message, it arrives at everybody else within delta time steps. And think of delta as 10 seconds. Okay. Now, this is a very old model and uh, Things have been very well understood in, uh, in this synchronous uh, communication model. In particular, early in the early 80s, we had some famous impossibility results, also some feasibility results. So we know that in this classic synchronous authenticated model, we can achieve consensus assuming that less than one third of the world, we cannot achieve it assuming that less than one third are, uh, 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 if 
less than one third, or, sorry, if more than one third are uh, corrupted. But if less than one third are corrupted, then we can achieve it. All right, so we need to assume that at least two third of the players are honest. Okay? However, if uh, we additionally add a public key infrastructure, so we assume that everybody has a registered public key, and these public keys are fully known by everybody, in that case, we can achieve better results. We can achieve security even up to n minus one corruption. So even if everybody except one player is corrupted, we can achieve both of these two properties. So that's great. Uh, unfortunately, these protocols require many runs. Um, but if we go somewhere in between, if we assume that we have n over two good players, at least half of the players are good, then we can achieve a protocol that uh, is robust in the public key model and also uh, runs very fast that liveness is gonna be an expected constant number of runs. So whenever I wanna add a message, it gets added uh, fast. All right, so this is very good. And as you see, these are results from a uh, long time ago and uh, really it clarifies the, uh, uh, what's possible and what's not. And let me just give you a high level overview of how these type of consensus protocols proceed classically, okay? And the general overview is very easy. So the protocol is gonna proceed in epochs, okay? In each epoch, we're gonna pick some leader. Okay, think of picking these leaders uh, in a round robin fashion. So first, player one is a leader, in the second epoch, player two is a leader, and so on and so forth. Or you can maybe pick them at random, right? But for now, just think of picking them uh, in this round robin, one, two, three, four, five. The leader's job is to propose a batch of transactions, or what we call in the blockchain world, a block, right? So he bundles up to uh, a bunch of transactions, into a block, and he proposes this batch of transactions. And next, we run what's called a Byzantine multi-value agreement protocol to make sure that everybody agrees on what this block of transaction was. Okay, so very easy. In epoch one, player one is a leader, he bundles together a bunch of uh, transactions into blocks, sends it out to everybody, and then we all run an agreement protocol to make sure we agree on what this block was, once we have agreed, we move on to the next epoch. It's clear? All right, great. So uh, I haven't really told you what business agreement is, but let me briefly go over it because it's gonna be useful to us. So an agreement protocol is, you can think of it as a, just a single shot consensus. It's a protocol to agree on a, a single value among a set of nodes. So in this scenario, we have a set of players just as before. Each of these players come with some input value so player I here in this picture has input value VI. They run some protocol, and at the end of it, they're gonna output some output value OI, okay? The agreement property requires that at the end of this protocol, any two honest guys will output the same thing, always, okay? So we always output the same value. Now, this is trivial to achieve agreement. We could just always output with zero, right? So we need to have some additional uh, non-triviality property, and that's the validity property which says that if all the honest guys have the same value as an input, V, in that case, they're gonna all output that also. So if all the honest guys start off with a zero, then the protocol makes sure that they output a zero. If they all start off with a one, they're gonna output a one, okay? And the bad guy should not be able to disrupt this thing. And finally, it requires some uh, termination property that this protocol should terminate fast. Fix, takes a fixed number of rounds, okay? Now, just to go back to our previous picture uh, or sketch of the consensus protocols, if we have this business here green protocol, then it's very easy to see that this recipe works. In particular, if the leader is honest, right, then he's gonna send out the same block batch to everybody, and then when we run the green protocol, we'll agree on that block. And that makes sure that we have live this. Whenever somebody wants to add something, when the leader is honest, he's gonna put it in a block and it gets added because the agreement property makes sure that we actually, uh, uh, or um, the validity property makes sure, make sure that everybody will output exactly that block and that block gets added. And in terms of uh, uh, consistency, consistency is gonna follow directly from the agreement property. Since the blocks, uh, since the business agreement protocol satisfies the Agreement property, we know for sure that everybody will always agree to the same block. Okay, very easy. Great, so now we understand how consensus protocols are classically constructed. And now let's move on to what actually matters to us. Okay, we would like to run consensus protocol on a large scale. Right? So maybe millions of nodes should be able to run it. 
These original protocols actually were not designed for that setting. They were designed for a setting with maybe three or five or maybe 10 nodes. But right now, in this blockchain world, we'd like to run it among lots and lots of nodes. And they just don't work in this scenario. And the problem is that in this large scale scenario, we need to have a protocol that scales well with the number of players. Mathematically speaking, scaling well is that the protocol's complexity should grow polylogarithmically in the number of players. Right? Now, these original protocols don't, but Nakamoto's Bitcoin protocol, the blockchain protocol, actually does. And it's an amazing protocol. The communication complexity of that actually does scale polylogarithmically with the number of players. So that's great, but the problem here is that, you know, we have to rely on proof of work and uh, we would like to have a protocol that doesn't do that. We like to have a protocol that works in a classic setting We just, where well, you have a certain number of players and they want to achieve uh, consensus without any use of proof of work. So the question is, can we do it? Okay? So a little bit more precisely, uh, when I talk about communication efficiency, I require two properties. The first one is that the total number of bits that get communicated on this network that get diffused should grow polylogarithmically with the number of players and, of course, needs to grow with the, the length of transactions. Okay? And the second property I want is that whenever someone wants to uh, confirm a transaction, the time it takes for a transaction to get confirmed should also not grow uh, uh, with the number of players linearly, but should grow polylogarithmically with the number of players. Okay, so I shouldn't have to wait uh, a million uh, rounds if you have a million players, or a billion rounds if you have a billion players, but really there should be something that grows polylogarithmically with the number of players. Okay? So is the, uh, what I'm trying to achieve clear? I want a protocol with communication complexity, and a time needed to confirm something grows polylogarithmic with number players. Now, uh, now you might think, unfortunately, all these bullets are coming out uh, earlier, but all right. Uh, so now you might think, wait, this should be really trivial to achieve, right? If we have a protocol that requires a large communication complexity, why don't we just subselect some committee of nodes and run the protocol among those? If I have, let's say, two thirds honest players, if I subselect a committee, then I know that roughly two thirds, by the law of large numbers, will also actually be honest among that subselection. So just run it among those guys. Easy. Now, there is a problem with this. Uh, and the problem is that while this works, assuming that the attacker uh, corrupts players statically before the protocol execution, if the attacker knows who has been selected to be on the committee, it's very easy to break the protocol, right? If I'm only sub-selecting polylog players, then the attacker can just corrupt all those guys, and that's gonna be less than, than one third of the players, right? So if the attacker can cor uh, adapt, adaptively corrupt players, sub-selection is tricky. I right, can't just subselect a, a node and run the protocol among them because the attacker can just corrupt them all. So, so that's what makes the problem hard. Okay. Now, what's known in this setting? So, yeah. So, what we'd like to get then is a protocol uh, that satisfies this property and also has adaptive security. That's what makes the problem non-trivial. Right? We would like to consider an attacker that can corrupt players uh, throughout the execution. Um, in particular in the middle of it. And in particular after, for, them, for instance, a committee has been selected. So the question is then that we'd like to uh, uh, ask is, can we achieve communication efficient consensus that satisfies also adaptive security? And I'm not sure why the slides are getting cut off here. Sorry about that. Uh, so that's the main question. And uh, before I address what's known about this thing, let me point out something uh, else. So Byzantine agreement, we said that's the same thing as kind of single shot consensus. That task actually uh, is known how to achieve with adaptive security and small communication complexity. At the very least for, for a single bit. If one agree on a single bit, it's known to achieve it. But uh, it turns out that this classic transformation, when you go from Byzantine agreement to consensus, it just actually breaks down, okay? So even though we can achieve it for a single bit, 
this transformation actually uh, doesn't work. And on a very high level, let me not go into uh, in details why it breaks down, but on a high level, the problem is that the validity condition of business agreement is too weak. If the leader is malicious, validity doesn't give us any uh, kind of uh, uh, guarantee, and uh, that's a problem for us. Okay? So, as we'll see later on, we will still rely on this original paradigm, but we're going to try to modify Byzantine agreement to get a stronger validity condition. So they're just looking forward. All right, but before I tell you about our solution, let me go over what's known in the literature about communication efficient, Byzantine, uh, communication efficient con consensus with adaptive security. Okay. So the first result is something I already mentioned. Nakamoto's blockchain protocol uh, has small communication complexity and intuitively uh, is also adaptively secure. And indeed, uh, that's something that we proved uh, in an earlier paper that Nakamoto's protocol actually does satisfy adaptive security, assuming uh, that an attacker controls uh, less than 50% of the computational resources in the, in the network. So Nakamoto's protocol is secure in this setting. It's great. Okay? But as we said, it uses, uh, it uses proof of work. And we'd like to avoid it. So there was another uh, work uh, a few years ago by Chen and Michali introducing the Algorand protocol that actually addresses this problem and, and provides a beautiful solution. So what they show is that in the public key model, and assuming also around Oracle, uh, there actually exists a communication efficient consensus protocol that satisfies adaptive security. And that's great. There's just a little catch. They assume something called the erasures model, or they're securing what's called the erasure model. So what's the erasure model? They assume that it's possible to, for players to perfectly erase uh, their state. They can erase memory in a perfect way, so that if they later on get corrupted, the attacker cannot add, uh, access the erased state. Now, it seems pretty reasonable, but it turns out that in practice, actually, it's very hard to perfectly erase things, unless if you burn your hard drive. Okay. But doing it in software is non-trivial. And furthermore, uh, another issue that's been pointed out in literature, if security relies on the fact that players, need, honest players need to erase state, they don't really have any incentives to do it because by not erasing it, they suddenly hold something that's valuable for an attacker to get. And uh, so it's not clear why they would actually do it because potentially they could sell this information later on. Okay. So, therefore, it would be highly desirable to have a protocol that doesn't rely on erasures. Okay. And so that's the main problem we're addressing here. But before telling you about our solution, it actually is going to be useful to point out how these proof of work and erasures help overcome this issue with adaptive corruption. Okay. So, let's remember, recall this issue that we have with subselection. The problem with subselection, if I'm subselecting a committee to run it, is that the attacker knows who's on the committee can simply corrupt them, right? So if I would like to do some kind of subselection in order to bring down the communication complexity, I need to at the very least address the issue that it should be hard to a priori predict who's on the committee, right? The attacker should not be able to figure out ahead of time who's on the committee, because in that case I can corrupt them, right? So let's see how the earlier solutions overcome this thing. All right, so if, for, uh, let me rephrase it again. If I can predict that you're gonna be on a committee in round 10, I should corrupt you now because I know that you're gonna do something that's valuable, so I should make use of it. Now with proof of work in Nakamoto's protocol, the key point is that nobody can predict who's gonna be elected leader because who's elected leader? Well, the way it's determined is you apply some random oracle to the current chain and the new block and some uh, puzzle solution I'm trying to figure, find. But nobody knows who's going to find the next puzzle solution, right? So before I found it, nobody knows who it's going to be. So that's great, and that's how Nakamoto overcomes it. Nobody knows. The Algorand solution, Chenny McKellar's solution, arrives on a beautiful idea of using something called a verifiable random function. So what's a verifiable random function? Think of this as a public key analog of a pseudo random function. So it's a, it's, a, it's a primitive that has a property that if I have the secret key, I can evaluate this function and find out what the value is, uh, but nobody else can evaluate it yet. 
However, once I give you the evaluation of the function, everybody can check that it's correct. So their protocol replaces the random oracle in Nakamoto's scheme by basically uh, applying a verifiable random function to the round number. So at every round, I apply, everybody applies their own VRF to the round number and checks if it's going to be smaller than some value D. Okay? Now I can evaluate this myself because I know the secret key, so I can determine whether I'm going to be elected leader at a particular round, but nobody else can do it. However, once I've determined I'm going to be the leader, I can tell them what the output is, and they can all verify that I was indeed the correct leader. It's a beautiful approach that allows the leader to find out when they're going to be leader, but nobody else can do it yet. It's only after I become the leader, everybody can check that indeed I was the rightful leader. All right, so that's a great approach for overcoming this uh, a priori prediction problem. Yeah? Well, the, the, uh, would I write like this? He can have evaluated it in the beginning of time. Yeah, I can know very, like, I just apply it to the round number, and then I find out when I'm going to be the leader. All right, so that's great. We have now seen that we can overcome this original uh, a priori prediction problem, but that's actually not enough. I actually need to overcome something even harder. I need to make sure that the attacker cannot a posteriori predict who is on the committee. So this is, seems a little bit paradoxical. So what do I mean by this? Even after I become elected on committee, and even after I've sent a message, it should still be hard for the attacker to find out who is on the committee. And that just seems impossible, right? The issue here is that after you speak, now I know that you spoke, so you're on the committee, why don't they just corrupt you? Okay? Uh, it seems unavoidable, but let's see how the previous solutions overcome it. So with proof of work, the fact that I was elected a leader and you corrupt me doesn't make me more likely to become leader for something else. And the key point here is that the leader election is tied to the message, that I'm, the block that I'm trying to actually get confirmed. So if you look at what Nakamoto does, remember I applied the random oracle to the chain and the current block and the puzzle. The fact that I confirmed a particular block, that I was elected leader for this block, that I could add it, it's highly tied to the actual message. And therefore, the fact that I became leader for this thing doesn't make me more likely to do for something else. So corrupting me now doesn't help anything at all. All right? So really, you have this kind of bizarre a posterior prediction property also that corrupting me now doesn't make me any more valuable. Now with the VRF, that seems more problematic. Right? Because the fact that I was elected leader after I sent the message, now you know that I'm leader and you can make me send something else. So how do they overcome it? Well, this is where they use erasures. The leader, what he's going to do is he generates his message and then he erases his secret key before sending the message. So he irrevocably erases his secret key and we use something called a forward secure signature scheme. So he can still sign message in the future, but he cannot sign previous messages. And then he sends a message. Now the attacker says, oh, great, you're the leader. Let me corrupt you. But when I corrupt you, you don't have the key anymore. So you cannot actually make use of this leader. And again, you have the property that corrupting him doesn't really help. It's a beautiful approach. But as I said, the issue here is that uh, these erasures, now we see. Do I actually have an incentive to erase my key? No, because I can now sell it to an attacker and he might be willing to pay a lot of money for it. All right, so now let's see how we can overcome this thing. And a natural approach here would be to say, can I just apply the VRF, not just to the round number, but also to the messages I'm sending? Can I just do like Bitcoin? Okay, and now since these bullets are popping up, to, uh, Ahead of time, you see the, uh, the issue with it. So <laughs> the problem is what's called grinding, okay? If I apply the VRF to not only the run number, but also to the messages, now suddenly an attacker can try lots of different messages and make sure that he gets elected more often than needed, right? More often than he should, and that's a problem. And then security breaks down because now we're gonna make sure the attacker is gonna be elected leader basically all the time. 
right? In Bitcoin, that wasn't possible because everybody is doing this grinding, everybody is mining. But in these type of protocols, you want to make sure that everybody only gets a single mining attempt per round, and once you add a message into it, you're dead. Okay? So this is kind of where the prior work uh, um, leaves us. So our main theorem is, in fact, a way to overcome uh, this issue, and we present uh, the first uh, protocol that is communication efficient and fully adaptively secure without any erasures and without any proof of work. Okay? And it's going to uh, be secure, assuming that less than one third of the players are malicious, so under the same condition as Algorand. Okay? So in particular, no erasures, no proof of work, and in fact, no random oracles are needed using standard cryptographic uh, hardness assumptions. I won't have time to go into the detailed assumptions. You can look in the paper. Uh, and on a high level, our approach proceeds as follows. So we're going to rely on the previous kind of classic method of going from consensus, going from single shot consensus, like some kind of agreement protocol to consensus. But it turns out that, as we pointed out before, this notion of validity for Byzantine agreement wasn't strong enough. So we're going to define a different notion of agreement that we call batch agreement that has a stronger validity requirement. And I'll explain to you shortly what it is. Okay. Then the next step is going to be to actually construct this batch agreement protocol. And we're going to do it from something called herding, which is a social phenomena uh, that, um, that I'll discuss very shortly. Uh, and, um, and on a high level, the key uh, insight here is that once we use this herding approach to constructing agreement protocols, it enables us to use message-based leader election, just like in, uh, in Bitcoin, and, and that will overcome this a posteriori uh, election problem. So really, herding will allow us to do this message-based election without for the possibility of grinding. I will get to it very shortly. Okay? So, before I go to herding, uh, let me explain what batch agreement is. So as I told you before, it's going to be a, a variant of binary agreement or uh, of Byzantine agreement, but with a strong validity property. So here we consider a model <coughs> where players don't just receive uh, a single bit as an input, but they're going to receive some messages, some transactions from some environment. So there is some environment sending transactions to the players. Okay? And uh, over time, and then sadly at some particular time, that's called T0, the environment sends a message start to everybody. And at, when it sends the message start, the protocol starts running. Okay, so then the protocol runs, 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 runs. At the end of it, it ends, and people output some output, just as before. Agreement is just as before, that any two honest players will agree on the, uh, on the output. Termination, just as before, this thing should terminate in a fixed number of runs once it started. And now we have come to the validity requirement. So before validity just says if everybody gets the same thing, then it should output that. Now, what we're gonna require is that any transaction that was received not long, or that was received long before the start message was sent by some honest player should be included in the output, okay? So if the players receive the transaction before time T0 minus delay, it should be included, okay? So really think of this as a single shot consensus saying that any old transaction must be included in the block we're outputting, okay? Things that come very close to the deadline, well, who knows what happens with that, but anything that came at T0 minus some delay need to be included. Does the primitive make sense? Okay. Now, the reason why this primitive is useful is that once we have something like this, we can just compose it sequential to get a, a normal consensus protocol, just run many uh, batch agreement protocols, and uh, uh, consistency follows just as before as from agreement, and now liveness from this thing follows directly from the stronger validity requirement that all things cannot be omitted, so therefore uh, any transaction has been around for a while must be included in a batch, and therefore we have liveness, okay? So that's why this is a good abstraction. Now the uh, validity property is strong enough to just uh, get consensus. All right, now let's get to herding. How do we construct the batch agreement protocol? That's the key thing that we do, right? And as we said, we're gonna rely on herding. So herding uh, is this um, beautiful uh, model that was uh, developed by uh, Banerjee, 
who coincidentally actually got the Nobel Prize actually a few weeks ago in economics. Uh, and uh, what Banerjee looked at was the following. We have a set of players. They all get some signal about the state of the world. Okay, so let's say the state of the world that we're trying to determine is, let's say, does smoking cause cancer? And we all get a signal that's correlated with the truth. And let's, for now, simplicity assume that all these signals are as strong. So everybody gets a bit bi, and this bit is equal to the true straight with probability one half plus epsilon. Let's say with 75% probability, it's correct. Okay? And now the question is, how should we determine what the true state of the world is? Now, we actually know that by the law of large numbers, if we all announce our signals simultaneously and look at the majority, then we're going to find out what the true state of the world is with extremely, extremely high probability. Right? That's something um, uh, sometimes often called the, the wisdom of crowds. Right? Even if our signals are just 51% accurate, if we get many of them and everybody announces simultaneously what the, uh, their signals are, then we're going to get the true answer with very, very high probability. Right? So that's great. Okay? So that sh shows there should be faith in humanity. Even if we just have uh, very bad signals, we come together uh, as a group, we can get the right answer. Now, what Banerjee said is like, unfortunately, people don't always act uh, simultaneously. Instead, often what we have is a scenario where people announce their, uh, their signals or announce what they think that the state of the world is one by one. Okay? So let's say that we consider some game where players are going to go one by one and they're going to announce what a guess for what the true state of the world is. So does smoking cause cancer? And they get high utility if the answer is correct and low utility otherwise. Okay, so we go one by one. Uh, so let's say that uh, now all this, it's revealed here. Sorry about that. But uh, <clears throat> all right, so player one goes. Okay, what should it, don't look at the slides, okay? Tell me instead. What should player one do? All right, clearly he has his guess, he has his belief. He tries to, uh, he doesn't have any, anything else. He clearly should output, his guess should be his belief, right? Very good. Now player two goes. Player two has seen the guess of player one, right? And he's also seen his belief. Now, so he actually sees like two signals. Let's say that he was gonna trust himself more than another guy. So he was also output, he's also gonna output his belief. Okay, so the first two guys, everything is just as before. They both output their beliefs. Now let's see what happens with player three, okay? And let's say it was the case that the first two guys output zero. Smoking does not cause cancer, okay? And the third guy now, his signal he got was that actually smoking causes cancer. He got a one. What should he do? Now, if he thinks that the first two guys are rational, the guesses that they output are actually their true signals. So from his point of view, he now actually sees three signals. He sees zero, zero, and one. They're equally strong. What should he do? Anyone? You can see it on the slides, but... <laughs> well, <laughs> he should just ignore his own signal, right? He should just say, like, well, if those two guys said zero, we have two signals for zero, I have a signal for one, probably it's more likely that zero. If he wants to get high utility, he should go for a zero. Okay? So he's actually, on his own, ignoring his signal and goes for a zero. Okay, what happens with player four? No matter what he has, he's gonna go for a zero. And then eventually everybody goes to zero. So we call this an information cascade. The fact that the first two guys said zero, zero, even if everybody else has independent and strong signals about the true state of the world, they're gonna ignore it and just gonna all say zero. Uh, so that's what I refer to as the foolishness of crowds, that once we go one after another, even if we have strong signals, independent signals, uh, with high probability, you'll get a cascade that gives you the wrong, totally wrong answer. So this has been a very highly influential work 
that's been used to describe, for instance, the spread of uh, fake news on the, uh, in social media more recently, right, where people, the all articles that they post, most likely they would like to post things about their beliefs, right? But if all their friends are posting something else, they're like, well, probably they know something I don't know, so uh, I will just post whatever they're posting. And then we get this spread of things that uh, uh, make no sense at all, okay? So that's very negative, all right? Uh, very sad state of affairs in the world. But for us, we really don't care about truth in this context here. The only thing we care about is agreement. So I don't care if they agree on the true thing or the false thing. Uh, I just want them to agree, right? So we're going to be using, oh, so, sorry. So we're going to be using this, uh, this approach to construct a consensus protocol, OK? Let me just actually point out here a, a little bit more. Uh, we discussed here before in this concrete example, but really what players should do in this herding thing if you assume something called common knowledge rationality, so common knowledge rationality is that uh, everybody's rational, everybody believes that everybody's rational, everybody knows that everybody knows that everybody knows, and so on and so forth. In, under that assumption, so that's what you need, under that assumption, the right thing for players to do is they should always guess the most popular choice so far. So really, a little bit more uh, precisely, they should combine all the votes they have seen Right, all this, uh, the message people sent before, uh, with their initial belief, and then go for the most popular thing. As we said, if we have two zeros and a one, I should go for a zero. So I just use majority of what I've seen, combining my initial belief and whatever I've seen. Okay, so that's the herding mentality we get. And we say that herding mentality leads to these foolish crowds. Okay, but as we said, we don't really care about truth here, oh, now this isn't going to be an issue. Uh, sorry, this slide is problematic, but I'll walk you through it instead of, even though it's... Uh, so here is how our batch of green protocol is going to look. Each node at every round is going to compute a score for a batch, for each batch of transactions that they see, they're going to compute a score. What is this score going to be? It's going to be, just like in the Hurden scenario, a mix of some initial scoring. This is kind of like how I would initially believe uh, what the, that the transaction is, plus the number of votes I've seen for the transaction. So the score that I give to a transaction is initial score plus the number of votes in the transaction I've gotten. And then at every run J, this is what each node is going to do. First of all, they're going to check if they're eligible to vote for a transaction, okay, by applying the VRF, now not just the round number, but also to, to, to the transaction. So note now that we have this transaction-specific vote eligibility. So it's message-specific, and that will be, it's what pre prevents this a posterior corruption. And next, they will vote for the most popular transaction they have seen. So a little bit more precisely, at every, no at every round, the node looks at what is the transaction, batch of transactions, that is the most popular so far, according to itself, right, by computing the score thing, which transaction has the highest score, check if I'm elected leader to vote for this thing, and if I have been elected leader to vote for it, I cast a vote for it. Okay, so we're just running exactly the herding uh, protocol, with the uh, only twist is instead of letting the players go one by one, player one, player two, player three, we let them go in an order that's determined by the VRF. And the VRF is applied not just to the round number, but also to the transaction. So we're electing leaders based on transaction, and then people go uh, and they apply exactly the hurting thing. Okay? And we continue this, what's hidden now, we continue this for uh, polar logarithmic number of runs. And then uh, at, the, uh, at the end of this number of rounds, each node outputs a transaction that has the highest number of uh, votes so far at the end. Okay? Is the protocol clear? Very easy, right? We just have this uh, scoring function that is combining some initial score. I haven't told you what initial score is. I'll tell you shortly. Uh, and uh, the number of votes I've seen for the block. And, uh, uh, and at every round, people compute what is the most popular block so far, according to them, according to the score, and they will check if they can vote for it, and the way they check it is by applying the VRF to the transaction and the run number. If they're elected leader, they vote for it, and we continue like that. 
Now I need to tell you what this initial score is, right? Because I haven't told you that yet. How do I form my initial beliefs? In the herding thing, the initial beliefs came from externally, right? It was just people got some signals originally. Here, uh, we want to agree on transactions that are not, we want to agree on batches of transactions that don't censor all transactions, right? Remember that the, the validity requirement was that if I have a transaction that uh, all the transactions that have been sent a long time ago need to be included. Okay? So I'm going to compute an age of a block as I'm going to define the age of a block as being the, the, the time since the oldest uh, transaction that's been censored, it's the age of the oldest transaction been censored. So if this block has missed a transaction from one minute ago, then the age is a minute. Okay? If it misses a transaction from three hours ago, the age is three hours. Does that make sense? All right, so if the block does not include transactions that I have seen myself three hours ago, but that the leader now is censoring somehow, then the age is old. Then the age is three hours. And this is now how I compute my initial score. It's going to be some constant to the power of uh, h. Okay? So what this does is something that is exponentially decreasing with h. So blocks that are old, in the sense that they censor a lot of things, are going to get a very low initial score. Blocks that contain everything I've seen are going to get a high score. That's what we have. Okay? So remember again, the way the scoring works is that blocks that contain everything that I have seen, they are not censoring anything, they get a high initial score. But if I censor, if the block censors a lot of transactions, then I'm going to give it a, a score that decreases very, very fast, so it's going to be very low. Now why do I do it in this complicated exponential way? Well, the key thing here is that, uh, is that this scoring method satisfies these two uh, observations I wrote up there. The first thing is, any two honest guys will be having, uh, will be scoring every block in roughly the same way. The initial scores of any two guys are going to be roughly, roughly the same. And it relies on the fact that this exponential uh, function is, is very smooth. And the fact that we have this delta diffusion assumption. So whenever an honest guy sees something, we know that all the other honest guys have seen the same thing within delta time. Okay, so therefore the age of any two guys is going to be within delta of one another, and, uh, and therefore this, um, we have this property that they, the initial scores are consistent. And the second thing, so which is very important, is more or less what I said before, that the initial tr transactions that I see if a block contains all the transactions I see, I'm going to give the high score. But something that's old is going to get a very low score. In particular, what I wrote here, uh, which you don't see, is that the initial transaction is going to get a score of C. But, uh, uh, but anything that doesn't, anything that's really old that doesn't contain uh, things before T0 minus delta uh, is uh, going to have a score of C over 2, so something very low. Okay. So now in the last few minutes, Let's, at a very high level, explain why these two properties are, are useful to us. So the first observation was that all honest guys have roughly the same initial score. So what that means is that since we have the same initial score, uh, and we're going to see the same number of votes, again, by this diffusion assumption, we know that honest guys, the way they're going to vote is going to be consistent. Honest guys are going to vote in roughly the same way. In fact, almost always in exactly the same way. And what one can show, and this follows using similar techniques to the way you analyze Nakamoto's blockchain protocol, is that some transactions are going to get a lot of votes because good guys are going to be voting for the same transactions. So they're going to get something like two-thirds K or K some security number of votes if you set the parameters right. So that's number one, that some transaction will get a lot of, a lot of votes. Then observation two we said was that uh, the initial transaction I have is going to get a score of C, but all transactions get a score of at most C over 2. What that means is that if I set this constant C to be very high, good guys will never vote for all transactions that contain that sense a lot. 
They will not vote on blocks at sensor lot. And uh, that means that all things can never get a lot of votes because it's only the bad guys can vote for them and the bad guys are only one third and so they will not be able to uh, uh, get a lot of votes. So we know for sure then that whatever the protocol outputs at the end uh, is what has the most votes and that needs to be something that's valid. So that directly implies validity. So all transactions can never be output at the end by good players. Okay. The second thing is agreement and this is going to be uh, kind of fast. But uh, assume for contradiction that two honest guys can output two different transactions, Tx and Tx prime. The point here is that good guys will only vote in every round for a single transaction. So the number of votes that these good guys can cast for either Tx to Tx prime uh, is going to be something we can make sure it's going to be something like two, a little bit more than two thirds uh, k. Okay, so. On the other hand, bad guys, they could try to vote for both Tx and Tx prime. There's only one third uh, bad guys, one third and bad guys. So they will maybe get, can vote one third for the first one and one third for the second one. So in total, they have also two third votes, two third K votes. Now, what this makes sure is that we have a total number of votes for, for both Tx and Tx prime, which is, two-thirds k plus two-thirds k, which is less than four-thirds k, okay? And, uh, uh, and so this makes sure that you cannot, both of them, if the total number of votes on both takes and takes prime is less than two-thirds k, then not both of them can have more than uh, two-thirds, sorry, it's four-thirds k, not both of them can have more than two-thirds k, so at most one of them can have that many. And since we said that something has two-thirds k votes, uh, we know for sure that, um, it's going to be the, uh, uh, the right thing. Okay, so this was very, very fast. I'm running out of time here, but um, I didn't really go into this grinding uh, issue here. Uh, uh, and it is actually an issue. The slide here became very ugly and running out of time. But let me just uh, point out here is that this issue of grinding uh, seemingly still arises here. The attacker can still try a lot of different transactions and maybe he can find some transaction on which he would be able to get lots of votes. The previous thing just says that if I fix a transaction, the number of votes that I can get on that transaction is going to be uh, roughly, the attacker can get uh, roughly one third K votes on that transaction. But maybe I can find a transaction for which I get many, many, many more votes. So let me say it again. For every fixed transaction, with high probability, the number of votes the attacker can get is one third K. But maybe if I can find some transaction such that after the fact, after you see the number of votes, it has many more than that. In other words, maybe I can find something for which the, the error probability, like the, the, the Chernobyl kind of fails. The, the way we overcome this thing is that the law of large number, the Chernobyl bound, holds except with exponential small probability. So for every fixed transaction, probability channel upon fails is two to the minus k. If the number of possible transactions is less than two to the, much smaller than two to the k, I can make use of a union bound to make sure in fact that for no transaction, the channel bound fails. And uh, so even if you try all the possible transaction, you will never get more than uh, uh, one third k votes on it. So, to just like point out like this bizarre thing that happens, the attacker will be able to get lots and lots of votes. This is different than in, in Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, the number of votes the attacker gets is proportional to uh, uh, his mining power. Here, the attacker can actually, for every possible transaction, he can get one third K votes. Whereas the good guys will actually only vote on a single transaction. So the number of votes the attacker gets is very, very big. But for every individual transaction, he can get at most one third K votes. And since we know that the good guys are gonna make sure to get two third K on something, even though he gets a lot of votes, he can never, like a lot of transactions with small number of votes, that still doesn't disrupt things for the, the key transaction. So uh, admittedly that was a little bit vague, but uh, you can look at the paper for more, more details. So to sum up, we presented a protocol that achieves uh, communication efficient consensus 
uh, and uh, even in the presence of active attackers, assuming that one, less than one third of players are uh, honest. And in particular, no erasures, no, pro no proof of work. Uh, and what I think is most exciting about this approach is that it uses this method of, of hoarding from the, the eco literature in order to uh, construct the consensus protocol. In fact, intriguingly, when we first started looking at this, uh, uh, this problem, we actually just came up with a consensus protocol using, using herding, and it was only later that we realized that it achieves adaptive security. That wasn't actually the, the key purpose. We were just trying to look at a different approach to getting consensus protocol, and uh, so I believe this method probably has other advantages also. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so this is kind of what I uh, very briefly was saying here. The, so that is actually the, the technically most uh, challenging, but actually it's nothing new in this paper. Actually, it relies on the analysis of blockchain protocol. So using similar method to the way we analyze Bitcoin's blockchain protocol, you can uh, make sure that there will be some transaction that's going to get a lot of votes. And it relies on the fact that honest players are all have the same view because they, their initial scores are similar, so they will be voting consistently. So you can get something similar to what's called chain growth in uh, for Nakamoto's protocol, and you make sure that actually the uh, the number of votes some transaction has does actually grow with uh, with the runs. Oh, uh, which one on the? Oh, this was just so Banerjee in his paper he analyzed. Uh, he analyzed herding uh, using something called Nash equilibrium. And uh, when I'm teaching this in class, uh, I do it using common knowledge as a weaker assumption. So this is just in the, in the lecture notes. When I teach it, I teach it with common knowledge, which is weaker than Nash equilibrium. So it's me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. <laughs>